you have a Bible, open up to Luke. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. We're going to start there. <clears throat> Let me just pray. I know we prayed, but it helps me. I need all the help I can get. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that, again, you are already here. We honor you. We acknowledge your presence, Lord Jesus, that you are in our midst. I declare that your kingdom is at hand. I ask you to release the manifestation of your kingdom, your righteousness, your peace, your joy in the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, I ask you to come and release your anointing. I pray for the power the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come in a mighty way to manifest your presence, Lord Jesus, that you would walk through this place. God, I thank you that tonight you are breaking yokes of oppression off of the necks of your people. You are breaking the yokes of religious bondage. You are breaking the yokes of generational curses. I thank you, God, that tonight you are setting captives free. You are breaking chains. And I pray, even as I speak, for the fire of the Holy Spirit, God, to fall upon every person in this place. God, upon those that are watching through the live stream, I pray for your Holy Spirit to fall. I pray for you to pour out your love into our hearts. And I pray for chains to break instantly tonight. Lord, I ask you to expose the powers of darkness to expel them, Lord, to set captives free for your glory, God. I thank you that you are speaking over your people. God, you are speaking to the powers of darkness, saying, let my people go tonight in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we commit this time to you. Let your word go with power, with authority, with your anointing, with your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're in Luke chapter 12. I sensed the Lord leading me in this direction of uh, sharing a message on really freedom from the religious spirit. Freedom from the religious spirit. I also felt like God wants to address um, freedom from spiritual abuse, the effects of spiritual abuse. I wanna, I'll explain more about that as I go, but I felt like that's going to happen tonight. There's going to be freedom from the effects of of um, hypocrisy, religious abuse, spiritual abuse, legalism. I'll explain more as I go. But if you look at Luke chapter 12, it says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another. This is a big, large crowd of people that's here in this place. And he says, it says, He began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. What you have spoken in the ear in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. I find it really interesting that of all of the things that Jesus was warning his disciples about to be aware of, to be on guard against, what did he go after? He didn't say, beware of sexual perversion. Now, do we need to be aware of that? Absolutely. Does the Bible talk about that? Yes. He didn't say, beware of anger. Does the Bible talk about that? Yes. There's a whole list of things we could say here. But what did he go after when, he's, when he was warning them? He was warning his disciples. The crowds were huge. Thousands of people. Multitudes of people. And he zones in on one specific area. And he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now what is leaven? Leaven is what you put in bread. It's yeast. It's what you put into the bread that gives it a permeating effect and causes it to rise. A little yeast leavens the whole lump, the Bible says. So you just put in a little bit of influence. A little bit of this influence infiltrates the whole system. 
A little bit of this. And there's different times in the Bible where Jesus warned against the leaven. For, in this time it says the Pharisees. There's other pl- passages where it says the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Other passages that warns against the leaven of Herod. There's three specific ones. We're going to focus on the leaven of the Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? Who were the Pharisees? They were the most religious people on planet Earth. That's not an exaggeration. They were the most religious people on the planet. They studied the scriptures from the time they were children. They memorized whole books of the Old Testament, of the Torah. They learned, they studied. They were meticulous about the laws, about the rituals, about the ceremonies. They were the religious leaders of their time. That would lead supposedly to, we're supposed to be leading God's people in the law, in the temple. And Jesus says, Watch out for them. He didn't say, Watch out for the rough folks. He he didn't say, watch out for the drug dealer. He didn't say, watch out for the gang member. He didn't say, watch out for the prostitute. He didn't say, watch out for the gambler or the drunkard. He said, watch out for the Pharisee. Isn't that interesting? Who murdered Jesus? Imagine spending your whole life studying the scriptures, looking for the Messiah, and then murdering him when he came. How deceived do you have to be? Beware of the leaven, the influence, the teaching, the doctrine, the spirit of the Pharisees. <clears throat> and then he goes on, he says, which is hypocrisy. So he defined what is the leaven of the, of the Pharisees. It is hypocrisy. I used to think that the foundation of the religious spirit of the Pharisees was legalism. We'll talk about legalism in a little bit. It is part of it. It's an important thing to understand. I used to think that was the foundation of the Pharisees. Legalistic, man-based religion and rules and regulations that you, know, you, you had to perform to know God. You, you, you had to work your way, earn your way to God. I used to think that's what the foundation of the Pharisees were, it actually, Jesus defined it right there. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Then he says, for there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Why does he say that? Well, if you understand what hypocrisy is, this makes perfect sense. Because what is hypocrisy? Jesus talks about it in Matthew 23, and he's rebuking the Pharisees, and he says, you're like whitewashed tombs. Woe to you, Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs that present yourselves nice and clean on the outside, but inwardly are full of dead men's bones, full of greed, full of wickedness. You portray an outward persona of holiness when inwardly you are full of darkness. The word hypocrite means actor in the original Greek language. That's what it means, an actor, a phony. In the, that time period, actors would wear masks in order to be in their character So if they were acting as a certain character in a performance, they would use a specific mask so that they could enter into that character and they they would present this character of who they were. That's what actors would do. They were called hypocrites. They were actors. So that word was taken from that to mean a religious phony, an actor. And Jesus said that the type of acting that they did was to portray holiness outwardly, to hide 
wickedness inwardly. Whitewashed tomb. The Lord downloaded to me a revelation on hypocrisy a couple years ago. It turned into a book called Hypocrisy Exposed. I'm not going to get into all the details. We'd be here for hours. But there was a phrase that the Lord showed me. That a hypocrite is not a righteous man who sins, but an evil man who pretends to be good. There is a difference. Sometimes we think hypocrisy is when a person falls from their standard. Like Peter, when he said, Lord, I'll go, I'll go, I'll die for you. Even if they all run away, I'll never run away. I'll never, I'll stick by your side. Even if I have to die, I will, I'll stand by you. Peter said that. A couple hours later, he denied Jesus because the servant girl said, weren't you with him? He stumbled. He fell. We would often look at him and say, what a hypocrite. He, he, he spoke this big thing and then he, 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 he couldn't live up to it. What a hypocrite. But according to the true definition of a hypocrite, Peter was not a hypocrite. Jesus said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Peter, you have the right spirit. Peter, you have the right heart. Peter, you're sincere, but you don't realize how weak you are in your flesh. You're sincere. You, you truly want to do this. You truly, you, you, but you haven't conquered your flesh yet. You don't realize how much of yourself is still ruling inside of you. And so when you're faced with this situation, you're not going to be able to handle it. Peter wasn't a hypocrite. He was sincere. Do you know who was a hypocrite? Judas. Judas was a hypocrite. You can see this clearly in John chapter 12 when Mary of Bethany pours the oil onto Jesus, the expensive oil, a year's worth of wages is poured onto Jesus. And Judas goes, Why wasn't this given to the poor? This could have been given to the poor. We could have cared for the poor. Oh, Judas, so nice. What a good guy. How noble, right? So noble. You know, it's easy to care for the poor when you're stealing from the money box. I almost made a political comment on that, but I won't. I guess I just did. <laughs> Easy to care for the poor when you're stealing the money. You know what it said? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because as the one who kept the treasury, he used to help himself to what was given. Evil pretending to be good. He was acting. He was living a double life. He was portraying holiness while living in wickedness. There's a lot of examples in the Bible we could go through, but I need to progress here. Hypocrisy. But Jesus said that that's how the Pharisees operated. The religious leaders. I moved to Lancaster County nine and a half years ago. And I knew next to nothing about the religious traditions in this area. I knew what, I know, I'd heard of Amish, of course. You, you, I knew a basic idea of what it was. I'd heard the name Mennonites. But I like to joke and say I didn't know a Mennonite from a Canaanite. Because <laughs> I didn't know anything, I didn't know anything about Mennonite background. I just knew it was a branch of Christianity and I knew a little bit about, you know, the dress and the conservative. I got, but I knew nothing about it. And so, you know, you just think the, the Amish is, you know, quaint and, and nice and all this kind of stuff. And then, you know, you, you come to find out there's a lot of darkness. I don't say this to bash Amish background. There, but the, the, you find out there's a lot of rampant sexual abuse. There's a lot of rampant spiritual abuse. There's a lot of cult-like behavior. There's a lot of false accusations. There's a lot of demonic activity. It's actually, there's a very dark underbelly. Not necessarily in every single Amish community or home, but over and over and over again. 
Same with a lot of what I found about a lot of you know, Mennonite tradition. There's a lot of abuse swept under the rug, a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of things that just gets hidden and covered and pushed over. But it makes sense because of what Jesus said. But let me, let me tell you, it's not just Amish, Mennonite. It, this, this leaven has infected every denomination and non-denomination in our nation. From Pentecostal, Charismatic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic, Think about the abuse scandals in the Catholic Church. Think about the abuse scandals in the Southern Baptist Convention recently. Think about the exposures that have happened in the last couple years of leaders that were held on a pedestal, leaders that were held to be these amazing people. Some of them even have had really good teaching gifts that were accurate in their teaching. But they were living a completely double life. And Jesus says that's hypocrisy. And he says it will be exposed. Because that's what the verses say. For there's nothing hidden that will not eventually come to light. And that's in the context of hypocrisy, of cover-up. Just yesterday, I saw a video of a, I'm assuming a non-denominational church. I don't, I don't know anything about the church. I don't know where it is. I just happened to see this video where it became exposed right before the congregation that a pastor had groomed and sexually abused, a, starting from teenage, a, a teenage young lady, and then ongoing from there for, I think, nine years. It literally got brought to the surface in front of the entire congregation. Like, it was wild. He says, nothing that's hidden will not eventually be brought into the light. Hypocrisy will be exposed. It takes a serious lack of the fear of God to live that way. Because God is not mocked. Let's, let's go a little bit further. Actually, we're going to go backwards in the, in the scripture here. We're going to go to Luke 11 because it gives a little more specific definition of this leaven, this religious spirit. in how it operates. <clears throat> so back up to Luke chapter 11, verse 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. This turned into a dangerous idea. <laughs> so this Pharisee. <clears throat> so he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. They had all their customs and washings and ritual, you know, traditions and all that. And Jesus didn't go by that. So he was astonished. But look at verse 39. Then the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. Foolish ones. Did not he who make the outside make the inside also? But rather, give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. But woe to you, Pharisees! You tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Woe to you, Pharisees! You love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. The 
of verse 46. He said, woe to you. Oh, sorry, I should, I should back up here a little bit. 44, he talks about the graves, walking over graves. Look at verse 45. Then one of the lawyers, now lawyers, it doesn't mean attorney like we see today. It means an expert in the law, an expert in the law of Moses, like a, a scribe or a teacher of the law. So when you hear him saying lawyers here, he's not, th- you don't think of like modern day lawyer. Think of an expert, a scribe in the scriptures. <clears throat> one of the lawyers answered and said to him, teacher, by saying these things, you reproach us also. Like, Jesus, you're, you're kind of offending us here. He just opened the door for the next punch. <laughs> so Jesus turns his attention on the lawyers now. And he said, woe to you also, lawyers. And I just, I want to say that as I was reading these passages tonight, I had such a sense of the broken heart that Jesus said these things with. Like the passion, there was righteous anger, but I believe there was a brokenness in his heart. I believe there was tears in his eyes. I believe when he spoke these things, it wasn't just about him being critical and harsh. It was him being burdened with the effects that this religious Pharisee hypocrisy spirit had had on God's people in that generation. He said, you load men down with burdens hard to bear. You yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You put these heavy weights on people's shoulders. You put these heavy burdens, you load them down with guilt. You load them down with fear. You load them down with control. You load them down with oppression. You load them down with condemnation. And you won't even lift a finger to help lighten the load. Woe to you. You build the tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. Verse 52. Woe to you lawyers. This is the one that just... You have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves. Those who were entering you hindered. He's saying, listen to this. This is so critical. The very people that were meant to represent God and lead people to God were the barrier that kept people from getting to God. He says, not only do you not enter in, but then all the people that are hungry, all the people that are looking for God, all the people that are wanting to get in, you actually put a barrier. You take away the key from them and you lock them out of the gate. You keep them from entering in. Very, it's very unfortunate to have to say that this same spirit is alive and well today. Not just in what we would think of as the religious type arenas. Not just in what we would think of as the conservative, the Amish, the Mennonite, the Catholic, the ritualistic traditions. In the charismatic movement, in the quote-unquote, spirit-filled movement in the prophetic arena. This is happening in every area of the body of Christ. And just because a person is not wearing the long robes of the Pharisee doesn't mean that that spirit of the Pharisee is not at work. You love the best seats in the synagogues. You love the place of honor. You love the titles. I'm telling you, this whole topic of honor has been so twisted. 
I believe in honor. The Bible teaches about honor, about honor, obviously, first towards God, honor your father and mother, honor leaders, absolutely. It has been so twisted. The entitlement, the demands, the, <clears throat> the love of money, the demand for special treatment, the demand for first class or special flights and special hotels and big honor. I just, I'm telling you, God is done with it. God, God is seriously done with it. <clears throat> it, it is a barrier keeping the people of God from encountering him. <clears throat> there, there are some people I just stopped following. I just stopped following. Even if some of their teaching was good, even if some of their writings were good, I just... We, because we, we've put up with it. We, well, that's just kind of the way things work. Or that's just, well, you know, yeah, maybe he's this way, but he is, he is really anointed. He really, you know, he does bring a good, it's like, we have put up with it. We have, we have been, ah, it's okay, maybe it's a little bit off. We've put up with it. <clears throat> we've let things slide. We've let predators in the pulpit. We've let greed in the pulpit. We've let, you know, manipulation and, Money, you know, grab all, all this stuff. <clears throat> so what are some of the characteristics we can pull out of here of, of the religious spirit that might have influenced you in some ways? Because I want to make it practical. I'm speaking kind of big picture here, but I want to make it practical. What, what are some of the ways that this spirit might have actually influenced your life and your walk with God? I'm going to name a couple different areas. <clears throat> One is what I said already, which was hypocrisy. And maybe you've been impacted by that in the sense that maybe you've been actually hurt from the hypocrisy of other people. When you've lived in the situation where there was a double life, when there was abuse happening behind closed doors, but, the night, but, the, but it was nice and clean on the outside. And you live in this confusion because the very one who abused you, everyone praises as such a great, wonderful woman or man of God. But, but, but behind closed doors... They've abused you. They've sexually violated you. They've verbally abused you. They've oppressed you. They've controlled you. But in public, it's looked so pristine. Maybe you've been affected that way. Maybe you've been affected by what I'll call spiritual abuse. Because hypocrisy goes right with it. Legalism goes right with it. We'll get to legalism in a second. What is spiritual abuse? That is when something related to God is misused for the purpose of exploiting, controlling, abusing, or dominating, or manipulating another person. So maybe it's the Word of God, like the Scriptures. Maybe it's a position of spiritual authority. Maybe it's prophetic words used to manipulate or control. Maybe it's condemnation, false accusations. I hear horror stories of people that have come out of abusive church situations and they're told, if you leave this church, you're going to go to hell. Or their family shuns them, cuts them off. Says, you can't be part of this family anymore because you left this specific church denomination or spiritual leaders that use the scriptures to try to beat people into submission to them and try to control their lives and try to hoard them and try to control them it can happen in relationships it can happen in marriages where scripture is used to control other people. Let me tell you something. God's word is never meant to control your will. And God's word from another person. Like God's, the use of God's word 
is meant to teach, it's meant to instruct, it's meant to equip, it's meant to uh, correct, absolutely. It is never meant to be used to manipulate or control you. It causes such confusion. I think spiritual abuse is one of the most evil types of abuse. <clears throat> Why? Because it takes a person's own love for God and uses it against them. Because the people that get influenced by this type of abuse, they sincerely love God. They sincerely want to obey God. That's why it's effective. If a person was rebellious and didn't care what God thought, then whatever, quote, quote the Bible all day, I don't care. But they, people that love God, people that have a sensitive conscience, people that have a pure heart, people that want to obey him. And so when scripture is used against them and they're not able to sift through, then it's like they're put in a position, well, oh, if I don't do, if I don't do what this person says, then I'm going to be disobeying God. If I don't obey what this person said or... Let me give you a tip. It's going to help somebody. You don't have to obey a scripture when it's quoted to you by the devil. <clears throat> you like that, Kurt? See, the devil did this to Jesus. Remember when, when, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, Matthew 4, first he said, if you are the son of God, turn the stone to bread. Jesus went to the Bible. He went to the scriptures. He quoted Deuteronomy. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's in the wilderness. He's fasting. He's hungry. The devil appeals to his human need for food. He appeals to him, and, and, and Jesus quotes the scripture. So what, what does that tell me? He used the scripture as his position of authority, as his foundation for truth. So what did the devil do? He changed his tactic. The very next temptation, it says, the devil took him to the holy city, to the pinnacle of the temple, a holy place. And he said, oh, I see. You live by the scriptures. Okay, now I know what I can do. He took him and he said, if you are the son of God, jump off from here, for it is written. He shall command his angels concerning you, and they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He quoted Psalm 91. He quoted it perfectly. Quoted the Bible. And what did Jesus say? It is also written. Or as the New American Standard says, on the other hand, it is written. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, sometimes we have to have a, the other hand. Because you can take a scripture out of context and make it say whatever you want. Somebody could take a scripture to use it to control, to manipulate. If, if we're not grounded in the whole counsel of scripture, if we're not grounded in God's heart, because see, you can't separate the word of God from the heart of God. You can't separate the word of God from the spirit of God. Because the Bible says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So when you separate the written word from the release of the spirit, you end up with death, not life. So the word of God, when it becomes separated from the heart of God, the intention of God and the spirit of God, it is no longer the word of God. The word of God in the mouth of the devil is not the word of God. It's the word of the devil. Does this make sense? So some people have been affected by this, abused by religious things, abused by positions of power, abused by authority, abused by, even by scripture, abused by prophetic words used to manipulate. Another area that maybe you've come under the effect of, as I mentioned earlier, is legalism. 
See, because the Pharisees, they had hundreds and hundreds. They had all these extra rules, all these extra things. And in order to be right with God, from their perspective, you had to live up to every single rule, every single area. This is how you earned your way. This is how you became good enough for God. This is how you made your way into God's presence. It, it was totally disconnected from the heart of God. That, that, that's what legalism is. Legalism is counterfeit holiness. Legalism is what people resort to when they're not actually holy. Or sometimes it's people that are sincere, that actually love God, but they're caught up in it. Both scenarios can be true. Legalism is when we think we have to earn God's favor. We have to earn God's grace. We have to earn God's love. We have to be good enough to get close to God, where that's not how the gospel works. Holiness is absolutely essential. But legalism and holiness have nothing in common, truly, in the, in the spirit of it. Outwardly, perhaps. So, legalism and grace are opposites. You can't have a balance between the two. True grace produces holiness, starting on the inside. Notice he said the Pharisees, they cleaned the outside of the dish. They, they cleaned everything up. They portrayed this because they were legalistic. They wanted to appear righteous. They wanted to appear holy. They wanted to show and prove, but inwardly they, were, they weren't changed. See, the gospel changes us on the inside. The grace of God changes us on the inside, and it works its way into our behaviors. It works its way into our words. It works its way into our thought life. It works its way into our actions. So absolutely, God calls us to holiness. But legalism will never produce that holiness. Because we can never be good enough. We can never earn it. We can never really get to that place. So if you're weighed down, right? What did it say? He said you're weighed down with heavy burdens. You always, if you're under a legalistic spirit, here's some of the things you, you, you'll, you'll feel. You'll, you'll feel condemnation a lot. Condemnation is the counterfeit of conviction. Condemnation makes you feel horrible about your sin without giving you any hope of forgiveness. That's what condemnation is. It's, it beats you down with guilt, shame, fear, judgment, all this stuff. But it actually never shows you the way of escape. Where conviction, conviction that comes from the Holy Spirit, it also makes us aware of our sin. It brings that sin up to us. It shows us the sin for what it is. And it draws us into godly sorrow that leads to repentance and forgiveness and salvation and transformation. We want conviction. We need conviction. But condemnation, you know it's condemnation. Why? Because it's hopeless. When there's hopelessness, that's when you know it's condemnation, not conviction. When it's conviction, yes, you become aware of the sin, but there's always, it points you to Jesus, who's the solution. He paid the price for it. He shed his blood for it. So if we're under a under legalism, that means we're trying to earn God's love. Maybe, maybe it'll manifest itself with perfectionism. Where I'm, no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, I just cannot seem to feel like I'm, I'm, I'm there. I cannot seem to feel like I'm good enough. I cannot seem to feel like I'm loved. I cannot seem to feel like I'm accepted. That's perfectionism. Maybe you grew up in a home life where, that was, where that, that's what it was like. Maybe you're, with your parents, maybe you always felt like it was never good enough. No matter what you did, no matter how hard you tried, there was always something wrong. There was always a criticism. There was always, parents, this is, this is so huge that we, don't, that we don't perpetuate this. It's so important that we don't perpetuate a cycle of perfectionism where we hold an impossible standard over people's heads. And no matter what they do, there's always something to criticize. Always something to point, oh, yeah, but, but this. Oh, but you could have done that. Oh, you. That doesn't mean you can't bring correction. Of course we bring correction as parents. Parents, we will have many opportunities to test this. 
I, I just, I think of a situation, I think of my, my son, um, Jude, he's 11. He played drums for the first time in our church a month or two ago. He's been taking drum lessons. He played drums for the first time. Oh, he was so excited. He practiced, he practiced, he practiced uh, the song Happy Day. You guys know the song Happy Day? Oh, happy day. Come on now. No. <laughs> um, he was practicing, practicing. Chad, our worship uh, leader, was giving him lessons. And so finally it was the day, and he was kind of nervous. And so, you know, he's back there in the drum cage, and I take out my phone. I don't always like to film during worship, but you know what? My son's playing drums, so I'm, I'm going to get this a little. Well, you know what happened? The, literally the very first beginning of the song, some people may not even notice it in the congregation, he dropped his drumstick. He, he, like he, actually, he actually dropped his drumstick. He made such a good recovery. Like, I was so proud of it. He, he made such a good recovery. He literally just, he kept his composure. He picked the stick up. He got right back in the rhythm, and he starts going. He starts going. He starts going. Let me tell you something. How I respond to my son in that moment is going to have a dramatic impact on his identity and on his future and how he moves forward. What if the first thing I said when he comes down, I can't believe you dropped that drumstick. How could you do that? How foolish. You know what that tells him? No matter what he does, no matter how hard he tries, he's never good enough. If you grew up in an environment like that, you live with this impossible standard placed over you, and even if you are, at, most people that have come under of like a perfectionist. They're actually like really talented, really excellent, really great at things, but they always feel like they're never good enough. And other people are like, what are you, like, you're amazing. Like, yeah, but they have trouble receiving it. They've what did I say to my son? I gave him a hug. I said, I'm so proud of you. That was amazing. It was, it was so good, Jude. It was awesome. And I was like, you re I was like, you didn't drop the stick, but you picked it right back up, and you just, you just went right along. Like, like, what good would it be for me to bash him? Like, what, what, poss what possible good would come from that? Like, what? I don't even understand it, but. But if we have a legalistic mentality, we live under the burden of condemnation, guilt, perfectionism, shame, and that's what the religious leaders held over people. Why? Because it kept them in a position of control. Kept them in a position of power. In the religious spirit, there is no freedom. God's kingdom, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That doesn't mean there's lawlessness. That doesn't mean there's no order. That doesn't mean there's not guidelines, but there's Freedom. One of the ways you'll know if you're in a religious culture is what happens when you feel led to move out, to move on. That's one of the ways you'll know if this is a, a leaven of the Pharisees or if this is a kingdom culture. When you say, you know what, I feel like God's leading me to move out of this place and go to a different church, or I feel like God's calling me to move to a different region. I mean, I had one pastor tell me I was listening to the devil. That was years and years ago. I was in a different state, so don't try to figure out where this was. <clears throat> I thought I was being honorable to bring him in on the process because I felt like God was leading my wife and I to move to a different geographic area. So I wanted to bring my pastor in on it and just, hey, like, just want to update you and bring you in the process. And, you know, and. But I was told I was listening to the devil. 
because I was leaving his church. It's not the only, I could tell, I could tell a lot of stories. Oh. Another one used prophecy to manipulate. See, because to the religious spirit, to the leaven of the Pharisees, they're your people, not God's people. And so you are like Pharaoh, keeping the people of God enslaved in order to build your kingdom. People are being moved on to leave somewhere. We, so we bless them. It's, it's not always fun. Things change and people leave. It's, it's part of life. It happens. We're just, we bless you. I thought about, this is going back to the legalism thing. I, I, I was reminded of the story of Martin Luther. Do you guys know who Martin Luther was? from the 1500s, the Great Reformation. I was reminded of this story, and so I looked it up to make sure I wasn't remembering wrong. So uh, as the story goes, in the 1500s, see, Martin Luther is one of those examples of a person that actually he, he, he sincerely, like, he really wanted to love God. He just had no one to show him. He was under a system like this. He was under a system where the heavy burdens were put on and where the key of knowledge was taken away, where they created a barrier. And so this is at the height of the corruption in the Catholic Church and, you know, indulgent. You pay money to save your relatives and all these crazy things that are going on. And there's a story where he was uh, going up the the steps in Rome. There's a certain steps. I can't remember what their significance is, but there's supposed to be some holy type of steps. And you climb these steps on your knees. You You climb up these steps. As a way of trying to prove your devotion and prove your, you know, worship to God, you, you, have, to, you have to prove your suffering. You know, he's, and, and as the story goes, he, he, as he's climbing these steps, I can't remember if it was like halfway through or at the top of the steps, he hears the voice of God break through. And he hears the voice of God say, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And that was the seed that launched the Protestant Reformation, the recovery of the doctrines of Scripture, the recovery of the doctrine of salvation by faith, by grace through faith, the recovery of what it means to actually be born again internally, not just have these laws, this out, outward legalism. Uh, legalism. Hypocrisy, spiritual abuse, legalism. There's another one, ritualism. What is, what is ritualism? It's empty religious routines without life. It's empty going through the motions without any actual relationship with God. It's thinking, if I repeat this prayer 15 separate times, then I'll get X result. It's I mean, that's, that's like an obvious example. We could do the same thing just going to church. We could just go through motions, empty. We could say prayers, empty, right? So this can, this can apply in many things, but that's another characteristic of a religious spirit is ritualism, going through empty routines, empty rituals, no life, no vibrancy, no true connection to God, no true relationship to God. Here's one more I'll mention, and we're going to go into ministry time in just a couple minutes. One more I'll mention is traditionalism. Watch out for the isms. The problem's not tradition. The problem's traditionalism. There are some traditions that could be great. 
What is traditionalism? It's like denominationalism. Some denominations, it's not necessarily wrong to be in a denomination. I mean, we're not. We're non-denominational. But there's a lot of great believers that are in denominations. I'm not saying it's always wrong. But denominationalism is when you make an idol out of your denomination. Traditionalism is when you make an idol out of your tradition. And so Jesus, one, one, time, he, one time he rebuked the Pharisees. And he said, you make the word of God of no effect in order to maintain your tradition. You elevated your tradition and made it equal or greater to the word of God. So when there's empty traditions that have no basis in Scripture that are held up to this high level as if they're God, as if they're equal to God's word, that's a religious spirit of traditionalism. And again, you could, there's various examples that we could think of. Sometimes it's church traditions. The way we do things. Because that's how we've always done things. Religious traditions, you know, different, you know, things that get elevated and equal to God's word. That's part of that religious spirit. That's part of that leaven of the Pharisees. Now let's stand to our feet because I want to go into some ministry. Hopefully I haven't talked too long. I know this is a little bit of a different kind of a message for a deliverance service, but just following how I felt the Lord leading, and we're going to have some time of ministry. We're going to do corporate ministry for deliverance. And um, I actually, I, I really had a sense in uh, today in prayer and in preparation that the Lord really wanted to break these yokes of bondage. And the scripture says in Isaiah that the yoke is broken from the anointing, from the power of the Holy Spirit, the yoke. Remember what he said? You load them with burdens hard to bear. You put these heavy weights on their shoulders, this heavy yoke. I believe God wants to lift off heavy yokes that have been placed upon you through the religious spirit. Yokes of perfectionism, yokes of legalism, yokes of hypocrisy, yokes of spiritual abuse, yokes of false accusations and word curses and slander and witchcraft. Because let me, let me explain something. The, the, the religious spirit is actually a twin to the spirit of witchcraft. It's like the same spirit with a different face. That could be a whole other message. I've got to stop preaching. But it's, it, they function the same way. Control, fear, manipulation, power over people, rituals. Maybe I'll do the spirit of witchcraft next month. That might be a good idea. But I believe God wants to break the yokes of the spirit of religion. And I actually felt led to anoint with oil tonight. I, I typically have anointing oil with me. Um, but I really felt like tonight's going to be more, even more significant than, than, than normal. That when, that when the anointing is released, and there's nothing magic about oil. It's just obedience to Scripture, to anoint with oil. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to come in power and break the yoke, break religious mindsets, break traditions that have been held up against God's Word. Can we just come into God's presence and pray for, for a minute or two? Father, right now we just come in the name of Jesus. God, I come through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I declare the power of the blood of Jesus right now over every person in this building, every person watching this live stream. I ask, Father, right now in Jesus' name for your holy angels to come, to be sent on assignment, to minister according to your will. I pray a release now, Father, of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks the yoke. I pray a release of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks the yoke right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I say, let there be light, God. Let there be light, God. Let there be revelation, Lord. And let it bring truth, Lord, that sets us free. God, I declare healing tonight to broken hearts 
that have been wounded by the effects of hypocrisy, that have been wounded by the effects of spiritual abuse, that have been wounded by false accusations, that have been wounded by witchcraft and demonic assignments. God, let the power of the Holy Spirit come and minister, minister with great grace, with great power, with great anointing in this room right now. I thank you, Jesus. I declare that you are Lord. I bind any way the enemy would seek to interfere or distract or hinder as they be bound by the authority of Jesus' name. And I say, Jesus, would you walk through this room? Would you release your compassion? Would you release your love? Would you release your heart? I pray for encounters with your love in this place tonight, God. A revelation of your love, God. Outpouring of your Holy Spirit now, Father, in the name of Jesus. If you're on our ministry team, could you make your way to the front, towards the front? If you're on our ministry team, if you're on our prayer ministry team, could you just make your way to the front? I'm going to lead us in a, a brief corporate prayer, and then I'm going to have actually people come to the front. I'm going to have people come to the altar that, that, that need to respond, because I really feel like God wants to move on this altar. I felt that this day, today as I was walking through this room, praying earlier. I just really sensed that God wanted to touch people at the altar. Um, so this might look a little bit different than a typical way we flow. But I, I just want to lead us first in just a group prayer to be released from religious spirit. And even for some of you, it's generational. It's went in your family line. You know, the religious spirit can be generational. It says it in Acts 7.51, Stephen said, Talking to the religious leaders, he said, You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. See, it was generational. I want you to, we're going to pray to receive healing. We're going to pray to forgive. If we've been hurt, if we've been wounded, we're going to actually pray to forgive. Not condoning what was done to you. Not making it okay. But to release people that hurt us. To release people that abused us, misused because unforgiveness never brings freedom. It only brings more torment. So let's, let's pray this out right now. Let's just focus your attention on Jesus, okay? He is the healer tonight. He's the one that's going to deliver and heal. Just focus your eyes on him. And I want you to pray this out after me. I just want the whole room to begin to pray this out. Say, Heavenly Father, I come into your holy presence by the precious blood of Jesus. And I worship and honor you. You are the one true living God. And I thank you that you love me with a perfect love. And I thank you that you showed your love to me. That while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. So I thank you that the blood of Jesus was shed for me so that I could be forgiven. I could be redeemed. I could be delivered. I could be healed. I could be restored. I ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon me and to break every yoke of the spirit of religion, of hypocrisy, of condemnation, of legalism, of lies of torment, of guilt, of shame, of fear, and of control. I renounce every unclean spirit connected to the religious spirit. And I thank you that on the cross, Jesus, you became a curse for me to redeem me from the curse of the law. And to deliver me from every generational curse. And so I ask you to set me free from every generational curse. Every generational stronghold. I want you to pray right now to renounce any generational strongholds, any generational curses. 
that you're aware of in your family line specifically related to religion, if you see a pattern of that, if you see, um, if, you, if, you, if you recognize a pattern of it, if you see that in your family history, just begin to name that, begin to call it out. Just say, I renounce the spirit of perfectionism. I renounce the spirit of legalism. I renounce the spirit of control. I renounce the spirit of guilt and shame. Whatever, whatever fits your circumstances, whatever fits your family pattern, begin to renounce, begin to call it out, begin to name it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you come from a background where there's been false religion, or other religions outside of the Christian faith, begin to name that, begin to renounce idolatry, begin to renounce those traditions, those, those false religions. If you come from a background where there was occultism and witchcraft, begin to renounce, begin to call it out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you come with power? Would you come with power? Would you come with power? Would you come with grace? Would you come, Lord, to lift off the yokes and the heavy burdens? I thank you, Lord, that tonight you're setting people free from the spirit of heaviness and oppression. Thank you, Father. Now, we're going to walk through just forgiveness. We're going to forgive because the blood of Jesus was shed for us to be forgiven. That gives us the empowerment to forgive others. Again, don't base it on whether or not a person deserves to be forgiven. Base it on the fact that you were forgiven when, we didn't, when you didn't deserve, when I didn't deserve. And it doesn't mean it was okay. It doesn't minimize it. It doesn't justify the hurt, the wrong, the pain. I'm not telling you to stuff it. I'm not telling you to just pretend like it never happened, but I'm telling you to process it and release to the Lord. Release the forgiveness. Release any desire for revenge, any bitterness, any unrighteous anger. So pray this out after me. Say, Lord Jesus, because you have forgiven me, I choose to freely forgive every person who's ever sinned against me or hurt me in any way. I lay down all bitterness. I lay down all anger. I lay down all resentment. I lay down all revenge and hatred. And I choose to forgive. Now I want you to get specific here, okay? I want you to actually name those people. You just say, you say, right now, I choose to forgive. Now I'm going to give you some space. And I just want you to name those people that you need to name. You just say, Jesus, I choose to forgive. And just speak out the name of the people that you need to forgive. I'm going to give you a minute or two. Holy Spirit, would you come? <sighs> Holy Spirit, would you fall in this room? Holy Spirit, would you release your anointing? Would you release the anointing that breaks the yoke? I want you to say this out. By the authority of Jesus' name, I speak to every unclean spirit that has any influence in my life. And I command you to come out in the name of Jesus. I command every religious spirit, come out now in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of condemnation, Come out now in the name of Jesus. I command the spirit of shame. Come out now in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of condemnation. Come out now in Jesus' name. I command the spirit of legalism. Come out now in the name of Jesus. I command the spirit of oppression. Come out now in the name of Jesus. I just want you to lift your hands up to the Lord. 
And I'm just going to pray for a minute, and we're going to open these altars here in just a minute. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray the power of the Holy Spirit to fall upon every person in this room. I release that anointing now in Jesus' name that breaks the yoke, the power of the Holy Spirit. I command every heavy burden to lift off the shoulders right now in the name of Jesus. Every heavy burden that's been yoke, yoking the people of God, I declare, be broken now. Lift off now in the name of Jesus. Spirit of heaviness, come out in Jesus' name. Spirit of oppression, come out in Jesus' name. Religious spirit, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Spirit of condemnation, come out. Go right now in Jesus' name. Spirit of witchcraft, come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Christ. I rebuke every spirit of guilt, shame. Come out, come out in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the spirit of fear. Come out in Jesus' name. I command every spirit that came through spiritual abuse. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Every spirit that came through hypocrisy, abuse, and trauma. Come out in Jesus' name. Every spirit that came through hurt in a church setting, in a religious setting. Come out in the name of Jesus Christ. Go right now. Out, out, out in Jesus' name. I command a spirit of slander. Come out in Jesus' name. A spirit of false accusation. Come out now in Jesus' name. I command you to go. I break the power of every word curse spoken over you by religious leaders. I break the power of word curses. Come out in Jesus' name. I break the power of the lying spirit. Come out now by the authority of Jesus' name. Leave the people right now in the name of Jesus. God, let your power fall. Let your anointing fall. Let your Holy Spirit fall right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just feel like I need to open up the altar. If you just need to respond to this message, or if you know you're receiving from God, or something's happening, or you just know I need this, this message was for me, I need, to, I need to respond, I need to get some prayer, would you just begin to come to the front? Would you begin to come to the front? I'm going to anoint with oil. As many people as I can, I'm going to anoint with oil, and our prayer team's going to pray. But we just, I just want people to come to the front. Let's just let the Holy Spirit just fall on this altar. God, let the power of the Holy Spirit fall on this altar. Let the power of the Holy Spirit fall on this altar in Jesus' name. In the name.